What is my role in global justice? How do I make the world a better place? My first experience in ever going to the developing world was when I went to the Philippines as a young boy, where my family originates. I had this idea in my mind that I, coming from the United States, would be sharing knowledge, talents, and experience with all of these people. That in some way, not only will people be enthusiastic to see me, but in a way they would also be a bit envious of me because I came from a land of plenty and I knew that the Philippines was a land of, well, there was much poverty in the Philippines. These were my expectations and my expectations were not met. What I saw instead was I saw extended families. I saw happiness. I saw joy. Almost every evening, friends and family members would come by just to share in food and friendship and laughter. I thought of my, my parents who live in Ohio, and yes, they have friends, but it was nothing like these close, tight-knit tight -knit groups of family structures and friendship structures that I saw over there. This was my first time where I asked my question, this question. I said, how could these people, supposedly in need, be teaching me so much? How can they be giving me life lessons? It was also the first time I had ever encountered this notion of have and have nots, development, inequality, and even injustice. So I'm a documentary filmmaker. I've traveled the world working on different projects. As a scholar, I get a look at the intersections of development and ethnic conflict. Working for international organizations, I've been able to see what poverty looks like firsthand, not only globally, but also in the United States. As I was looking at these themes and these ideas, I ran into a lady named Frances Moore LePay. And what she did was she calls us, she called me, to reframe hunger away from numbers to human experience, to human emotion. She said numbers can numb. She said that when you think of numbers and poverty, you start thinking that the, project, the problems are too big. It leads to apathy. She said that poverty is more than just the 22,000 children that die a day because of poverty-related ailments. ailments. It's more than knowing that the amount of people that go to bed hungry every single day is more than the combined population of the United States, Canada, and the EU. Poverty is more than that. I met this family in northern Philippines, in Luzon. It was a family facing a lot of difficult decisions. I met them in an ontology ward. They're waiting for their youngest daughter to finish up her weekly treatments. The father was a rickshaw driver, or a bike taxi driver. And he brought in roughly about 600 pesos per month, equivalent of about $15. The mom took care of their other little child and took care of the home and also took care of their modest farm. The treatments for this young girl was roughly about 550 pesos per month. 600 pesos, 550 pesos. The math added up to very painful decisions. Poverty is more than just numbers. Poverty is sorrow. Poverty is sorrow knowing that you have to make these difficult decisions about the ones you love, whether to provide them with medicine or to pay rent for the land. Poverty is insecurity. The insecurity of knowing that the loss of one or two days worth of wages could be the difference between caring for someone you love or not. 
Poverty is more than just numbers. Poverty is sorrow, it's insecurity, it's fear, it's humiliation, it's sadness. This is Winnie. She's an 11-year-old that lives near Lake Victoria in East Africa. She lived with her two brothers, Mark and Vincent, age 13 and 15. Their parents passed away about five years ago due to the HIV AIDS epidemic. Every morning, Winnie and her two brothers wake up at 4.30 in the morning. They study for two hours, they tend to their crops, they have breakfast, they walk Winnie to school, and then the two brothers come back, they study through the afternoon, pick up Winnie, help her with her homework, have dinner, and the cycle continues. We filmed with Winnie, and she's very quiet, very timid. And towards the last few moments of our time with her, serendipitously, I found myself in a very, very meaningful conversation with her. She told me that she's afraid that she's forgetting her mom's face. I asked her what she would do when she finishes up school, and what is she going to do when she starts making income for herself? First, she would build a new home for her brothers, because at every step of the way, her brothers were taking care of her. They would make money so they could go to school, but oftentimes it was only enough for Winnie's schooling. Second, she would build a home for orphans so that orphans in the future wouldn't have to worry about finding a warm meal or a roof over their head like her and her brothers have had to do. There's this commonly subscribed to notion that the poor are poor because of reasons. Maybe they're lazy. Maybe there's some predisposition that people have that can explain this idea of have and have not. Winnie's story challenges that notion. Waking up at 4.30 in the morning, studying for two hours in candlelight, digging ditches of their neighbors and tending to other people's crops so that they can just have enough money just to go to school. And oftentimes, it wasn't enough for all of them. It was just Winnie. When I was their age, I know that I would not have been able to display the perseverance that these young people did. And yet here I am today in a great department, in a PhD program. How could it be that Winnie and her brothers are teaching me so much? How could it be that that family in Luzon, who's making tough decisions about their family and their loved ones, be, be giving me life lessons? How could that be? What I realized was that this notion of development, this idea of have and have nots, I started to be able to think about it again from these experiences. I realized that poverty is more than these things that I thought they were as a young boy. I challenged that notion. I felt that development, what I've been known as development, is wrong, it's false that I've been given a bag of goods in a sense that won't sell. I started understanding this idea even more when I started working with youth in a Baha'i-inspired youth program called the Junior Youth Spiritual Empowerment Program. And here we teach young people about this idea of a dual transformation of society, a dual process. One side, you have an outer process, which has to do with material well-being, social structures, institutions. Another inner process, which has to do with character, virtues, and that which pertains to the human spirit. This dual process, it implies that we're all involved in this project of development. No matter if we have material plenty, which of course we have much to share, but we also have much to learn. Nor, also, if you live in material lack, you have much to give. You could be endowed with spiritual plenty. It also implies that these two processes are interconnected and they're dependent upon each other, that one must happen with the other one. I lived in northern England in the Lake District. And uh, 
I was able to tag along with a BBC crew that was interviewing a World War I veteran, a 104 World War I veteran, tucked away in the north part of England. At the time, there was only six World War I veterans that could speak in the UK. There was about three times that amount, but none of them could converse. If you could imagine, in this little town, this World War I 104-year-old soldier sitting in his favorite chair in his den, with all his military garb on and his medals, a few paces behind him, his 99-year-old wife was sitting behind him knitting. <laughs> they were both hard of hearing. Every so often when he was talking, he would lean over and ask a question, and where, where was I when this happened? What happened there? I don't know how they heard each other, but I suppose they communicated in only a, the way that a 100-year-old couple could. <laughs> they sh he shared with us stories. He shared with us a story about a time when he was in a trench and his two best friends were next to him. And the explosion happened. And his two best friends died in front of him. This man, he had a crooked nose and his ear was half blown off. He told us a time when he was sitting there in a battlefield and a sniper bullet went right across his face, took off his nose. Another time when his commander was right in front of him, got shot and died right in front of him. An explosion went off, blew off half his ear. He told us all of this very steel-faced, as if he was telling us what he was going to get at the grocery store or what he was going to get in the corner store. Until it came to one story. One story that he had never told his family, he had never told his wife or his friends. One time after a battle, they were, he was walking through a battlefield with his troops. And he saw a fallen German soldier sitting against a tree. The German soldier was obviously mortally wounded. His face was half missing. They made eye contact. The German soldier called out for water. And so the British soldier took his canteen off and started approaching the German soldier. When he was just about to reach him, his commander came by and grabbed him by the scruff of the collar and said, get back in the line, soldier. You don't know if he has a knife or if he is armed. And so as a good soldier, he did so. As he was walking away, he looked back again. And they made eye contact again. But this time, the German soldier was crying. Consolata. Consolata is a genocide survivor. When I heard about her story and her family story, I thought of maybe it had to do with death, close calls, harrowing nights. And it did. But it was much, much, much more than that. Consolata's story was a love story. It is a love story. When they moved from Rwanda to Tanzania through to Kenya, they regrouped in Kenya, and two years later, the husband started falling ill. For 10 years, the husband had been bedridden when I met her. Her community members, her neighbors would say, why are you still with this man? As you can see, she's a strong woman, intelligent. Her presence is very noticeable. How can you be with this man? She looked me in the eyes and said, how could I not be with this man? She told me a story. She said that when they were crossing these borders, every step of the way they would run into groups of soldiers. They would run into groups of men who would threaten them both. And every step of the way, he would pay their bribes. He would give everything, all their possessions, to make sure she was safe. He would even risk his own physical safety to make sure she wasn't touched. How could I ever leave a man like this, she says. I was in their room when she was sitting on the bed, stroking the husband's hand. You know that feeling of two lovers looking at each other and nothing else in the world mattered. The way she looked at him felt as if they were two high school lovers falling in love 
10 years of being bedridden. 10 years of being bedridden. A missed opportunity to show a stranger compassion. A missed opportunity to connect to a human soul in a time of need. Love that transcends time, place, or earthly ailments. These are values that pertain to the human spirit. A broader conception of development says that no matter if we live in material lack, we still have so much to teach the world. Conversely, no matter how much we have of material plenty, we have so much to learn from the world. At the beginning, I, I asked myself two questions. I said, what is my role in global justice? And how do I make the world a better place? I'd like to share with you a uh, quotation from my spiritual practice, the Baha'i Faith. Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i Faith, he said, regard man as a mine rich in gems of inestimable value. Regard man as a mine rich in gems of inestimable value. Thank you.